In the previous video, uh, I solved for the slope and deflection at two points on a real beam using the conjugate beam method. And this was the same beam that we used in, a, in another previous video to solve using the moment area method. Now in this video, I'm going to continue the previous example for the conjugate beam, uh, except instead of finding the slope and deflection just at two points, I'm going to find the so-called shear and moment diagrams, which are actually the slope and deflection diagrams of this conjugate beam in order to actually find the deflected shape of the beam. So if you'll recall from the previous, the previous video, our conjugate beam example looks like this. So we have a fixed end at the left with a uniform UDL between A and B, a hinge located at B, so a point of zero moment, a prop uh, roller here at C, and then a free end with a point load at D. And we have a varying I, which we've taken into account within our uh, curvature diagram, the M over EI diagram. And in the previous question, we were asked to find the slopes and deflections at points B and D specifically, which we could do by just cutting the, um, the free body diagram of the conjugate beam at those locations and finding the resulting uh, internal forces, which are actually the slopes and the deflections at both of those locations. So we found our conjugate beam and we applied our curvatures as loads on that beam and using those curvatures as loads then the shears and the moments that we get out of this conjugate beam are actually going to be the slopes and the deflections of the real beam. So how we determine what this conjugate beam looks like I went over in the previous video. So we're going to start from this point where we actually have our conjugate beam and we also solved for these reactions at B and D. So I've redrawn the situation here with our curvatures applied as a load, I've put the reaction at B and the reactions at D because this is fixed in our conjugate beam. And we have a hinge here at C as you can see. So if I want to find the slope uh, of this, of the real beam over the whole length, what I do is I find the effective shear force diagram for this conjugate beam. And that shear force diagram is actually the slope diagram of the real beam. So recall that the slopes the slopes in the real beam are equivalent to the shears in the conjugate beam, and the deflections in the real beam are equivalent to the moments in the conjugate beam. So we can start right off from the left, just as we were drawing any kind of shear force diagram. So our first area is this one here that's within this under the parabola to the left of where the parabola peak is. And during this time, the slope of the line that we're going to draw on the shear force diagram is generally increasing. Okay, so we start at some slope and then we can put it like this and then it generally increases. Okay, I'm going to draw it a little shallower than that to make space. And we can find out where that ends by finding the area underneath this parabola, and including this rectangle, which we did in the previous video. So we're going to get a line that looks something like this. Okay, this is not a zero slope at the end. There is some non-zero slope here. Maybe I can draw it a little bit clearer. Okay, I'll draw it like that. Okay. And then once we get to this point, we find the area under this distributed load, and we find that this is 195.0 over EI. Okay, and this was a parabola. Therefore, this one, after we integrate it, is a cubic. Okay, now, instead of increasing, the value of this parabola starts decreasing, which means the slope of this line, not the value of the slope, this line represents the slope, but the slope of the slope line here decreases, just as if we were drawing the shear. So if we had a load that was steadily decreasing in value, then we know that the slope of our shear diagram would be decreasing. So we end up with something that's this, decreasing, decreasing, until it gets to zero. So this is a point of zero slope, and that's about here. And so we can draw the slope decreasing, 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 until it gets to zero. And then at this point is equal to the full area underneath everything to the left. So this 195.0 over EI plus the area of this parabola to the right of the peak. And if we add all that up, we get 875.0 over EI. 
Okay, and this is also a cubic. Okay. So then once we get to B, we have a point load, an effective point load, and that is going to push everything down. So now we drop down by 1784, which is going to bring us to about exactly 909.9 .9 over EI. Okay, and now we have a straight line slope. So this is going to continue to push us down. So this, this force is pushing down. So the shear force diagram is also going to push down. And the slope starts at zero and then increases, increases, increases until our maximum. So let's find the maximum point here first, which is going to be around here, and that's called 1394.3 over EI. So I got that by adding 909 plus the area of this triangle. Okay, and we said the slope starts at zero and then increases, increases until the maximum. So it starts at zero and then increases, 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 increases. Okay, and then the slope is at some constant, and then it starts to decrease again. But our shear force is still decreasing because the slope, is, the load is still going down. So it's just the slope is decreasing until we get to our ma our zero. Slope comes back to zero, and then if we add up the triangle there, then we get 1878.6 over EI, and then this point load here at the end pushes us back up to zero so you see this is the same amount 1878.6 so that brings us back up to zero so this is kind of a good example of drawing a kind of complicated moment diagram or shear diagram based on some complicated loadings okay so these were linear so therefore when we integrate it this one here is a parabola. Okay, good to know. And we've got all the peaks and we know all these crazy locations. So the shear force was not too bad. The moment diagram, however, is a little bit trickier. So let's look at that. Okay, let's draw a line here. Okay, now I'm going to try to line up the points here. Okay, so this is A, this is B, here is C, right, and here is D. And in here we have a transition, okay, and that was 0 0.811. So let's mark off A, B, C, D over here too. A, B is actually about halfway, then C, then D. Okay, so we have A, B, C, and D. Okay, so this is a little bit tricky now. So now we have this cubic, and this cubic here, you know, usually when we want to find the area under parabola, we need one end or the other to be zero slope in order to apply our area equations. Uh, remember the area of a parabola is two-thirds, uh, if it's like this, it's two-thirds bh, if it's like this, it's one-third bh, right? And a cubic, if it's like this, is three-quarters bh, and if it's like this, it's one-quarter bh. So when you go from par parabola to cubic, the kind of bubble one gets bigger, gets fills more area, and the uh, the kind of ramp one fills less compared to the parabola. So finding this cubic area is not too easy. I mean, we could maybe try to estimate what that would be. But instead of doing that, why don't we start at the right side and draw the moment diagram from right to left instead of going from left to right like usual because we know these parabolas, we can find the areas for those. And then this cubic is not really so bad because we have a peak here. So let's start at D. So what happens if we want to draw our moment diagram from right to left instead of left to right? Well, basically everything just gets reversed. So usually if we have a point load like this, 
uh, a clockwise point load usually pushes our moment diagram up and a counterclockwise load pushes it down right but if we're going from right to left then a clockwise load is going to push down instead of up and a counterclockwise load is going to push up instead of down so everything's reversed and then usually when we're adding our shears and we're going from left to right a shear that's on top of the line pushes our moment diagram up and a shear on the bottom pushes it down but if we start from the right then a shear on the bottom is going to push us up and a shear on the top is going to push us down okay so everything is just reversed you just have to think of it in the reversed sense so the first thing that we have at this end is we have this point moment that we can't forget 42.93 over EI so since that's clockwise usually it would push us up but since we're coming from the right it's going to push us down by that same amount so let's just draw that straight down fairly straight down okay good enough so this is 42.93 over EI okay so now what happens between D and C well we have two pieces here that we can add we have this square which is 2.5 meters times 1394.3 and we have this parabola which is two-thirds times 2.5 times the difference between 1878 and 1394.3 so if we do that uh, if we add that up then we'll find the answer is going to be 4293 so we're going to find that it comes down like this now why does it go like this and not like this well the slopes still count so we start at a high slope so the value of the shear force diagram here is high so this is like a steep negative slope right so we start at that high slope and that slope reduces 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 but doesn't get to zero it still is negative when we get to C okay so it, it starts high reduces 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 when we get to C okay and this value at C is zero okay so the area this area in here to the right of C is equal to this moment okay which is convenient because in our real system we have a uh, we have a pin so at the pin we must have zero deflection right so if this is our Y diagram okay which is kind of our moment diagram if we have zero on this diagram that means zero deflection so we have to have this because our real system has a pin here so that makes sense now we can find the area of this one okay so now since these are the, on the bottom they're pushing up remember because we're going right to left so this is going to push up further we can find this by adding this rectangle and this ramp parabola that's in here okay so that one is one-third of the base which is 2.5 times the height which is the difference between 1394 and 909 and if we do that we find that our answer is going to be somewhere up here and it's going to be 2678.4 over EI okay and the slope of this is basically continuous so the slope is still decreasing decreasing until it gets to some non-zero negative number so this is this is still a negative slope right so we decreasing decreasing still decreasing but doesn't quite get to zero okay so there is some slope here okay and that's actually the real slope of our system incidentally so this is our hinge okay so when we come here we have a jump the slope jumps so the value of the shear is the slope on the moment diagram right so this shear jumps so the slope changes from a negative slope to a positive slope immediately okay something like this right which is allowed because in our real system we have a hinge and at that hinge we can have a kink right this the slope does not have to be continuous between the left side of the hinge and the right side of the hinge because of that moment release so we're going to have a negative slope to start with 
then that slope is going to steadily, steadily decrease, decrease, decrease until we get to zero. So it's going to look something like this. Now you'll notice I kind of avoided finding the area of this one since it's made up of cubics and finding the area of these cubics is non-trivial so we don't really necessarily care in this question what the exact shape of this is but if we wanted we could find might be easiest just to find the um, the equations of these cubic lines and just integrate them to find the area would probably be easier than trying to find the area directly but we do have all of the things that we are interested in is these peak displacements and we also know the deflected shape and what it looks like. So we've drawn something like this before. When we got to the end of our moment area theorem question, then we drew this deflected shape and it looked very similar. You see, So we basically have predicted this based on the moments, but now we have found directly what those values are. And at A, where we have a fixed end in our real beam, this is our real beam, we have a fixed end, we expect that that slope has to be zero because we can't have a rotation at a fixed end. Okay, so these ones, this is a cubic now because we integrated a parabola. So this is our parabola. We integrated that to get a cubic. And these are cubic. So that means that this line here is a fourth order polynomial. which is kind of nasty. Okay, so now we have these in terms of EI. We can convert those as we did in the previous question. So we have 2678.4. Remember, so these kind of moments are kilonewton meter cubed over EI. Okay, which is 26784 times 10 to the 12 over 205000. And this one is 1260 times 10 to the 3. These numbers are from the previous question. right? They're found right here. Okay, this is the E and this is the I. Okay, and here we get 10.36 millimeters. Okay, so this is 10.36 millimeters. And if we do the same for this peak down here, we get 16.62 millimeters. And that's what our deflected shape looks like. And these also happen to be the values that we calculated in the previous video using just the, the cutting method. So here's our 16.624 y at d.